We, some of you aren't here at the beginning of the week. This is sixth day that we've met together. We started Monday night. The first presentation Monday night, we, pardon me, there, yep, up, okay. It's probably here. Um, anyway, the first presentation Monday night was a, a presentation on the foundations. These meetings have been recorded if you want to uh, figure out how to get them. Um, and go back and see the arguments that we presented. But what we presented was that the truths that are represented on this chart, the 1843 chart, in the terminology of Ellen White, are the platform and foundation of Adventism. And that both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy identify that there is going to be an argument over the foundational truths at the end of the world. Most of us are familiar with, most of us are, <laughs> I'm getting some direction from the audience, but <laughs> it's, most of us are familiar with, if I could only speak without breathing, right? <laughs> okay, most of us are familiar with the, the endorsement of the 1843 chart that I'm pointing to here in early writings, page 74. You have it in your notes that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. But the first time that Sister White spoke to this chart was in Spalding McGann, page 1, where she said, I saw that the old chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. But in Spalding McGann, the first time she said that, as soon as she said that it should not be altered, she says, except by inspiration. We're not usually familiar with that. She, her comment on this chart is it should not be altered except by inspiration. All right. But in early writings, we're also confused, it seems, in Adventism because you'll find men and women in Adventism that said that this chart is full of mistakes. But when Sister White comments on this chart, she says the Lord held his hand over a mistake in the singular in some of the figures in the plural. And then on page 238 of your of early writings, she explains what the mistake was. It was the mistake 1843. And it's represented twice on this chart. So it was a mistake in the figures, plural. One mistake, the year zero, that represents itself in two places, two figures. And you cannot use the writings of the spirit of prophecy to say that this chart is full of errors because the spirit, according to the spirit of prophecy, there's only one mistake on this chart. It was the year 1843. And it should not be altered except by inspiration. And then we brought a quote where Sister White talks about the phenomenon from 1844 to 1846. That's the years that she gives. And in those years is when Sister White, it's up to you, where Sister White Turn out though. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. From 1844 to 1846 is the phenomenon where Sister White's mind was locked to the Word of God, but the brethren were studying. And they'd stay up all night long trying to come to an understanding of truth. And when they couldn't come to an understanding, then and only then, Sister White would be taken off in vision and she'd be getting, given the understanding of this truth that they were looking for. And from 1844 to 1846 is where the what we call the pillars in Adventism were established. And the pillars being the sanctuary, the law of God, the Sabbath, the three angels' messages. Then in 1850, Sister White was given a vision where she was instructed to tell her husband to make a new chart. This is the 1850 chart. James White hired Otis Nichols. This is the Nichols chart. You can see his name up here. To produce a new chart. In Adventism, we're not familiar with the endorsement about this chart. If we were, some of the controversies in Adventism over prophetic truth would be silenced. For instance, as an example, if you're familiar with the argument over the daily in the early part of the 20th century, the, the new view of the daily introduced by Conradi in 1901, and it shakes the church till, till Sister White's death in 1950, and it continues to grow to where today we teach the false view of the daily that Conradi brought into the church in 1901. In that time period, um, 
those people that were in support in the argument in the early part of the 20th century, those people that were supporting the pioneer position and arguing against Daniel and Prescott, the premier men that were pushing the new view of the daily, this is what they would argue about. They'd argue about Sister White's statement in early writing 74. In fact, I think it was Washburn. Maybe it's not Washburn. It's not coming to my mind. One of the pioneers, what he did, and he got, Sister White rebuked him for it. He reprinted this chart, and on the bottom down here, he put the quote from early writing 74 that says, Haskell, there you go, Stephen Haskell. See, he, his argument to preserve the pioneer position of the daily being paganism was, paganism in that controversy was to produce this chart and then put her comment from early writing 74 right on the bottom saying, this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. So whether you're familiar with it or not, when the controversy of the daily began, this chart was the point of reference. But, we don't usually know about the endorsements of this chart. Sister White says that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. She says, I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. Now, I'm just trying to give you an example. Over here, the argument is for 508 and the pioneer understanding of the daily. All it says is take away the daily sacrifice. Daniel um, 12, 11 and 12. But over here on this chart, that also has the prophetic endorsement. What it says here is pagan dominion or the daily taken away, Daniel 11.31. It says the daily is paganism in black and white. And that's what we said from the beginning here is that when it comes to the argument over these foundational truths, you can't separate the spirit of prophecy from it. Sister White has placed her endorsement upon these truths. We had a handout this week where we showed that the Biblical Research Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has sent out a position paper where they reject the 2520 now, based on the Hebrew in Leviticus 26, and they go a step further and say, we no longer accept the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. Now, brothers and sisters, Sister White directly endorses the pioneer position of the, tr the trumpets. If you've read Great Controversy, she places her seal of approval on Josiah Litch's prediction of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, says the event exactly fulfilled the prediction. So when you say we no longer accept the pioneer position of the trumpets that are represented on both these charts, then the foundational truths have come under attack. Okay, one, we had one presentation this week and I'll ask a question. We, we took the 2520, the 2300, the 1335, the 1290, the 1260, the 391 year 15 day time prophecy and we illustrated that every one of those prophecies are tied to one another. How many were here and remember that presentation? Okay, today in Adventism we have men like Amazing Facts, Doug Batchelor, Marvin Moore, who is the editor of Signs of the Time, Kenneth Cox, well-known evangelist. They take these prophecies and they place them at the end of the world. So do a lot of other people in Adventism. There's a lot of independent ministries that do the same thing. They take these prophecies here and place them at the end of the world in a day-for-a-day day fashion. But if you're going to do that, they're tied together. You have to take this and place it at the end of the world. You have to take this and place it at the end of the world. And you have to take this and place it at the end of the world. And brothers and sisters, when you grab those and place them at the end of the world, you've destroyed the foundations of Adventism. And the Bible and the spirit of prophecy says at the end of the world, there was going to be a shaking about whether we're going to walk in the old path. And there's a group in Adventism that says we will not walk therein. So what we've been doing here this week is trying to acquaint people with the fact that the shaking over the foundations is in Adventism now. And we're not trying to point fingers. We're trying to alert God's people to this fact. And there's, there's a, a very influential pe person in this area. He doesn't live in this area, but he's very connected with an organization here in Loma Linda. He's in the process of writing a book to show that the pioneers were wrong on the 2520. And what, what we were doing last night is saying that not only were the pioneers correct on the 2520, but how we understand it here at the end of the world, that the Millerite history be, con, began with the conclusion of the 2520 against the Northern Kingdom, and the Millerite history ended at the conclusion of the 2520, 
prophecy against the southern kingdom. What we were doing last night is showing you that the story of Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5 is a perfect type. It's a perfect parallel to the Millerite history. And that it, that history begins with the conclusion of a 2520 and it ends with the conclusion of a 2520. So you don't need the argument about the Hebrew in Leviticus 26 to demonstrate that Millerite history begins with a 2520 and ends with a 2520. And for those of you that weren't here last night, what we did was show that in each of these histories there's a warning message. For the Millerites it was the first angel's message. And I meant to put first angel right here. Got sidetracked. And we showed last night that, that Nebuchadnezzar is a perfect symbol of the first angel's message. The first angel's message in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 is the everlasting gospel. Verse 7 says, Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. That's the, that's the message in the Millerite history. But the everlasting gospel, according to Genesis 3.15, is the work of Christ in putting enmity between the seed of Satan and the seed of Christ. This was accomplished in the Millerite history and in the story of Nebuchadnezzar he represents a man that rejects the message when he rejects the idea that his kingdom is going to be taken away from him and his warning message came from none other than Daniel and the Millerite's warning message came from none other than Daniel but at the same time Nebuchadnezzar represents someone that has experienced the third angel's message because he's humbled at the end of the dust at the end of 2520 years so he, he represents two classes of worshipers he represents the everlasting gospel and in his history he goes through the same three step process that's in Revelation 14, 6 and 7 he learned to fear God and when he learned to fear God he stood up and gave him glory and he put in place a judgment message that was the warning message for Belshazzar so what this DP means divine pronouncement. In all of these histories you have a warning message. There comes a point where the warning message is rejected. In June of 1842 the Protestant churches closed their doors against the Millerite message. And then in the summer of 1844 there was a divine pronouncement. Babylon has fallen identifying that the warning message has been rejected. The warning message for Belshazzar was the story of Nebuchadnezzar which is the first angel's message. There came a point where Belshazzar determined he was going to party with the sacred vessels from the sanctuary. The door closes. There comes a divine pronouncement. Many, many tekel yufarsin. And we've demonstrated this week that along with being a verbal expression, many, many tekel yufarsin also has a mo monetary value that adds up to 25.20. And the divine pronouncement was the handwriting on the wall for Belshazzar. And in that very night, judgment came. Just as the divine pronouncement of the second angel's message in the Millerite history concludes with the midnight cry. And the climax of the midnight cry is when judgment began in 1844. We pointed out that in the very night that Belshazzar was killed, Cyrus came through the gates that no man could open. And Cyrus is a type of Christ. And on October 22nd, 1844, Christ came through the door that no man could open. This is an absolute airtight type anti type relationship establishing the 2520 at the beginning and ending of the Millerite history without touching the Hebrew of Leviticus 26. But we've also been looking at this week that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000. So I told you last night, those of you that were here, that we're going to begin with the notes from last night where we left off. I'm sure that some of you will not have those. We're just going to deal a little bit with these notes then we'll get into the notes that we handed out this morning. <clears throat> so I'm on, a pa I'm on page 10 of the notes from last night. If uh, you look at the top of the page it says from selected messages in history and prophecy the word of God portrays the long continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. And when Sister White is saying those things which have been will be repeated she's just given a second testimony to the biblical principle. You can see that illustrated in Solomon. Um, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 and 10 says the thing that has been it is that which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done 
And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see this is new, it has already been of old time, which was before us. And what, one of the principles that we're using more often than, or more than any other probably here, is that all these sacred histories are illustrating the history of the 144,000. But specifically, the history of the Millerites is the, the point of reference for the 144,000. Sister White says in Desire of Ages, history is repeating with the open Bible before them and professing to reverence its teachings. Many of the le religious leaders of our time are destroying faith in it as the word of God. They busy themselves with dissecting the word and set their own opinions above its plainest statements. And in their hands, God word God's word loses its regenerating power. This is why infidelity runs riot and iniquity is rife. And the religious leaders in Adventism at the end of the world that are going to fight against the latter rain message would, t would read this quote and say, that's talking about the leaders of the Protestant world. But brothers and sisters, the issue at the end of the world is the judgment of the living. And the judgment of the living begins with Adventism and then it moves to those outside Adventism. And the testing process in Adventism comes first. And there will be voices of influence in Adventism that will fulfill this statement as well as those outside of Adventism that do the same. In the days of the apostles, the most foolish heresies were presented as truth. History has been and will be repeated. There will always be those, though apparently conscientious, conscientious, will grasp at the shadow preferring the substance. They take error in the place of truth because error is clothed with a new garment which they think covers something wonderful. But let the covering be removed and nothingness appears. Now brothers and sisters, let me, let me point something out to you here. Those people in Adventism that are a many of the people, not all, there's different arguments, but many of the people in Adventism that today are resisting and fighting against returning to the foundational truths, they will say, those of us that are looking at these foundational truths, that we're infatuated with finding new things, new light. We're the ones that are seeking after new light. But the reality is, is we're dealing with old light. And they don't want to receive the old light because they are the ones that have fulfilled this. They're the ones that have taken error in the place of truth and that error has been clothed in a new garment. In 1901, the error of what the daily represented was clothed in a new garment. Now we all believe that new garment. See, we've, we've come to accept through the time that has proceeded since 1844 that this is a nice, maybe nice to hang on your wall just as a point of reference for early Advent history. But, you know, are these truths really, really valid still? And the answer is, is yes. And those people that are rejecting these truths are the ones that have taken these truths and covered them in garments of error. Now, I know that may seem a little bit mean-spirited, but we're in the final shaking of Adventism and it's time that we were clear about what's going on. Ecclesiastes 3, 14 and 15 says, I know that whatsoever God doeth it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nothing can be taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which has already been, and God requireth, and that which to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. We're required to understand the past history because that's going to be repeated at the end of the world. Okay, dropping down to the, the bottom of page 10, a quote we've used often. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. And the next quote on the top of page 11 says, I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time. And like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth to the close of time. In the Millerite history from 1798 to 1844, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter. And in the history of the 144,000, the parable of the ten virgins will be repeated to the very letter. Notice the next quote. This is concerning Revelation 14. The first, second, and third angel's messages are to be repeated. In the Millerite history, the first angel's message arrived in 1798. The second angel's message arrived in June of 1844. And the third angel's message arrived on October 22nd, 1844. The first, second, and third angel's messages are going to be repeated in the history of the 144,000. 
The first, second, and third angel's messages are to be repeated. Now notice what she says. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the first and second angel's message refused the third, the last tested message to be given to the world. Sister White teaches both that the Millerite history is going to, or that the parable of the ten virgins is going to be fulfilled in the Millerite history and repeated in the history of the 144,000. But at the same time, she says the first, second, and third angel's message that was fulfilled in the Millerite history is going to be fulfilled in the history of the 144,000. She also says that the first, second, and third angel's message are three tests. We dealt with that earlier this week. There's many truths connected with the three angels' messages. One of them is that they're three tests, and they're progressive tests. If you don't pass the first test, you're not involved with the second test. If you don't pass the second test, you're not involved with the third test. We went to early writings, page 259, where Sister White says, those that would not receive the testimony of John the Baptist, that was the first test in the time of Christ, could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. There's your second test. And she goes on to say, they could not see their way into the heavenly sanctuary. There's their third test. That's where their door closed. The, the door on the earthly sanctuary closed as Christ moved into the heavenly sanctuary. As soon as she has that paragraph, she talks about the Millerite history and she says, those that rejected the first angel's message could not be benefited by the second angel's message, neither could they be benefited by the midnight cry that, would, with, that was to teach them the way into the most holy place. Three testing, three tests, you don't pass one of them, you don't, you're not involved in the next one. Well, that means here at the end of the world, when the three angels' messages are repeated, there will be three tests in Adventism, right? And we went over those three tests. It's always three tests. When Jesus was baptized, and he went into the desert to be what? Tested. How many tests did he have? Three tests. All right, so there's three tests connect with these. We've dealt with that. Now, under the oil, because we're going to fulfill the parable of the ten virgins. It says, those who would be ready to meet their Lord, Lord must keep their lamps filled with the oil of grace. It was a neglect to do, it was a neglect to do this that distinguished the foolish virgins from the wise. They had lamps, but no oil. Their characters could not stand the test. The wise virgins had not only an intelligent knowledge of the truth, but through the imparted grace of Jesus Christ, their faith and patience and love constantly increased. Now I'm going to contend here that the way that the wise virgins, patience, faith, and love increased is by the reception of the increase of knowledge. You can't separate them by the word. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. All right. Their lamps were replenished by the vital connection with the light of the world. While the foolish virgins awoke to find their lamps burning dimly or going out in darkness, the wise virgins with their lamps burning brightly entered the festal hall and the gates were shut. Greatly rejoicing at the sound of the bridegroom's voice, they joined the bridal procession. What's the bridegroom's voice? This is the voice of Christ. In the Millerite history, and we understand this is Adventist, in 1798 at the time of the end, the book of Daniel was unsealed and there was an increase of knowledge and the students of prophecy of that history ran to and fro in God's word and understood the increase of knowledge. But Daniel 12.10 says, that many were what? Purified, there's a test. Tried, there's a test. And made white, threefold test. But the wise understood the increase of knowledge, but the wicked didn't. What produces the wise and the foolish virgins in this history, and therefore in this history, is the increase of knowledge. And how you relate to the increase of knowledge. The oil with which the wise virgins filled their lamps represents the Holy Spirit. And then she quotes from Zechariah. We've been, we've been through Zechariah a couple times this week. Um, dropping down to the, the third paragraph on page 11, it says, The anointed ones standing by the Lord of the whole earth have the position once given to Satan as covering cherub. By the holy being surrounding his throne, the Lord keeps up a constant communication with the inhabitants of the earth. The old golden oil that comes down through the two pipes... The golden oil represents the grace, grace with which God keeps the lamps of the believers supplied that they shall not flicker and go out. Now notice this next sentence. Were it not that this holy oil is pour, poured from heaven in the messages of God's spirit, the agencies of evil would have entire control over men. The oil is the messages of God's spirit. God is dishonored 
when we do not receive the communications which he sends to us. Thus we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those in darkness. When the call shall come, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Those who have neglected, those who have not received the holy oil, who have not cherished the grace of Christ in their hearts, will find, like the foolish virgins, that they are not ready to meet their Lord. They have not in themselves the power to obtain the oil, and their lives are wrecked. But if God's Holy Spirit is asked for, if we plead, as did Moses, show me thy glory, the love of God will be shed abroad in our hearts. Through the golden pipes, the golden oil, will be communicate, communicated to us. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord of hosts. By receiving the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, God's children shine as lights in the world. What prepares our characters to be among the 144,000 during the Sunday Law testing time is an experience of following the the progressive light as the lion of the tribe of Judah opens it up to us. But in that time period we will have a big temptation to fight against the light because this light is the everlasting gospel and it will produce two classes of worshipers in Adventism. And those two classes will be developed based upon how they respond to the golden oil, the communications that God sends us that comes down through the two pipes. Now we've dealt with um, a principle here before. If you notice underneath this, it was we have Revelation 10, 8 through 10. I'm just going to refer to this. I'm, I'm aware that some of you have not been here all week. But when a prophet becomes part of the prophecy, he illustrates God's people at the end of the world. And you see John in Revelation 10, verses 8 through 8, being told to go take the little book from Christ, the angel, and eat it. It will be sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. If you look closely, you'll find that John is told before he eats the little book that when he eats the little book, it would be sweet in his mouth and become bitter in his stomach. Therefore, we have always taught that John is representing the Millerites that ate the book of Daniel in 1840 and it became sweet in their mouth. It, it, they ate it in 1840 in the sense that the year-day principle was confirmed. That's when the book of Daniel became sweet to the Millerites. But by 1844 there was a disappointment and we've always thought that verses 8 through 10 of Revelation 10 represents the Millerites and it does but it doesn't. Primarily it represents a group of people that know in advance about this experience because Sister White's clear the Millerites didn't understand the experience that they were going to go through but the 144,000 are required to understand the Millerite history if they're going to be among the 144,000. They know in advance. We have history books that teach it. Courses in our universities that teach Millerite history. We know in advance about the sweetness of the book of Daniel and the disappointment at the end. We are the group that John is most specifically pointing to because in the passage, he's told in advance of him actually doing it, that this is what's going to happen. John, in verses 8 through 10, represents both the Millerites and the 144,000. When a prophet becomes part of the prophets, prophecy, he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world. We, underneath that, we, it says the special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angels' messages. It was not best for the people of God to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. The Millerites did not understand the experience in advance. We've looked at this week that in Zechariah chapter 4, you have it in your notes, that Zechariah, a prophet that was living in the time period when they were rebuilding the temple, he wakes up. And he realizes he doesn't know what the temple is because he's shown the seven branch candlestick. We all know that that's the, the candlestick in the holy place. But Zechariah, he doesn't know what it is. Even though he's a prophet living in the time that they're rebuilding the temple. And he has become part of the prophecy. And therefore he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world. He's illustrating the Millerites that woke up in the parable of the ten virgins at the midnight cry in the summer of 1844 only to find out on October 22nd, 1844 that they did not understand what the sanctuary was. They thought it was the earth, but it was the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, but in that passage... Zechariah is also representing Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world that wake up in the midnight cry of their parable of the ten virgins and they find that they don't know what those two pipes are. What are the two pipes that bring down the holy oil? If you drop down to page 13 in the center of page 13, the Great Controversy, page 273 says, 
and I'm going to take the second paragraph there. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them. Who's the two prophets? Who's the two pipes? The Old and the New Testament. But Zechariah, he lived in his history, didn't he? So that history had, the, that, that vision there where he sees the two pipes, it had to mean something to him, right? Were the Old and New Testament written when Zechariah was alive? What were the two pipes for Zechariah? The Law and the Prophets. And at the end of the world, the two pipes are not the Old and New Testament. What are the two pipes for Adventism at the end of the world? Pardon me? The Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. All right. And when, when God's people woke up in the summer of 1844 and they had to understand what the sanctuary was, what was manifested in the Millerite history at that time? The spirit of prophecy. We're the people that our two wit witnesses are not simply the Bible, the Old and New Testament. It's the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Okay. On page 14... This is a very important quote. And I would challenge you to mark this quote. Because of time, I'm just going to tell you about this quote. But you need to mark this quote. This expresses the pioneer understanding of something very important to recognize. This is James White, I believe. James White. James White here is teaching that in 1798, the book of Daniel was unsealed. But at the same time, he's saying that in 1798, the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation chapter 5 and 6 when he opens the book of Daniel when he unseals the book of Daniel in the book of Daniel that's illustrated in the book of Revelation when the lion of the tribe of Judah begins to remove the seals from the book that's in the father's hand that's sealed with seven seals you need to, you need to see that the work of Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah is a work that has to do with his unsealing the word of God to mankind in that particular generation. And the pioneers understood that when the lion of the tribe of Judah in chapters 5 and 6 of Revelation began to remove the seals from the book that sealed with seven seals, that that work began when the book of Daniel was unsealed in 1798. The books in Daniel and Revelation, it's the same story. So Dr. White says the same line of prophecy that's taken up in Daniel is taken up in the Revelation. <clears throat> now, now, in Revelation 10, verse 4, there's only two places in Revelation where Christ is illustrated as a lion. He's a lion in, in 5 and 6 as he unseals the book that's been sealed with seven seals. But in Revelation 10, verse 1, under seal up those things on the bottom of page 14, Revelation 10, 1 says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Sister White says this is no less than a personage than Jesus Christ. Clothed with a cloud, cloud and rainbow was upon his head and his face was as were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book. Sister White says the little book he had in his hand was the book of Daniel. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as what? As when a lion roareth. And when Christ is illustrated as a lion, it's representing his work in unsealing truth for his people based on Revelation chapter 5 and 6. As when a lion roareth, and when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. When Christ is portrayed as a lion, it has to do with the sealing or unsealing of his word. Now notice the next quote <coughs> from Sister White. It says, after these seven thunders uttered their voice, the injunction. What's the word injunction mean? Command. The injunction comes to John as unto Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. Brothers and sisters, I get a lot of criticism on this particular teaching. And one of the criticisms I get is that, you know, I'm just stretching things a little bit too far on some of these things. So I'm forewarning you, maybe I am and you need to test it out. But Sister White is here comparing the sealing up of the seven thunders with the sealing up of the book of Daniel. That's not me. It's right there. The injunction, the command comes to John, seal up the seven thunders, just like Daniel was told to seal up the book of Daniel. 
the point is, is at the beginning of the Millerite history, the book of Daniel at the time of the end is unsealed and the truth that comes from that unsealing is going to test this generation. And when this history is repeated in the history of the 144,000, the seven thunders are going to be unsealed and the truth that comes out of the seven thunders is going to test the generation of the 144,000. And if you were here this week, we showed that every reform movement parallels every other reform movement. So I'm not just pulling this out of the air. They're all the same. There's an unsealing at the beginning of every reform movement. Our unsealing has been specifically identified as the seven thunders, whatever that may represent. When the time of the end comes for the 144,000, whatever the seven thunders represents, it will be unsealed. There will be an increase of knowledge that will test that generation. And I can tell you when it gets unsealed. Revelation 22 verses 10 and 11 says this. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And there's only one prophecy in the book of Revelation that has been sealed up. It is the seven thunders. So in verse 10 of Revelation 22, it's saying, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. In other words, just before the close of human probation, there comes a pronouncement to unseal the prophecy in the book of Revelation that's been sealed up. And the only prophecy in Revelation that's been sealed up is the seven thunders. And the unsealing of the seven thunders parallels the unsealing of the book of Daniel in the Millerite history because the Millerite history was a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. And the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be repeated to the very letter. Yes, yes. So that sequence has to come before the Sunday law. The unsealing comes at the time of the end. We went over this this week. I purposely took time. Every reform movement has its own peculiar time of the end. How, re how many remember where we took time? Say amen if you remember. Okay. Testimony of two or three things established. Every reform movement has a time of the end. And at the time of the end, there's a, book of, there's a prophetic book that is unsealed. The time of the end for... Christ, for the reform movement of Christ, was his birth. And at his birth, the shepherds on the hill were studying prophecy, and they understood the significance of the birth of Christ. The wise men from the east, they'd been studying prophecy. They understood the significance of the birth of Christ. Anna and Simeon in the temple, students of prophecy, understood the significance of the birth of Christ. They were those that were running to and fro at that time of the end, when there was going to be an increase of knowledge on Christ, because that reform movement was about Christ confirming the covenant with many for one week. Every reform movement is the same. And at the beginning of every reform movement, there is a prophecy that's unsealed, and what's unsealed for the 144,000 is the seven thunders, whatever that may represent. So now let's try to show how the story of Belshazzar not only is a perfect type for the story of the Millerites, <coughs> But it's a perfect type for the history of the 144,000. The brothers and sisters, the 2520, that's a time prophecy, isn't it? And after 1844, is there going to be any more time prophecies? No. So if there is a 2520 that's fulfilled in the history of the 144,000 at the beginning, at the ending, <coughs> it won't be a time prophecy. Okay, it won't be a time prophecy. Page one of your notes, everyone should have these. In the history of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, God's, God speaks to the people today. The condemnation that will fall upon the inhabitants of the earth in this day will be because of their rejection of what? Rejection of the love of God? Rejection of faith? Rejection of light? There is going to be an increase of knowledge that will test this generation. Our condemnation and the judgment will not result from the fact that we've lived in error, but from the fact that we have neglected heaven-sent opportunities for discovering truth. The means of becoming conversant with the truth are within the reach of all, but like the indulgent, selfish king, we give more attention to the things that charm the ear that, and please the eye and gratify the palate than those things which enrich the mind, the divine treasures of truth. It is through the truth that we may answer the great question, what must I do to be saved? Now we've been dealing with probably our main point of reference this week is Jeremiah 
6, verse 16 and 17. We've dealt with it more than once. You see it there referenced. And here's what we've been teaching about it. I think we've proved it. Thus saith the Lord, stand you in the ways and see, and as for the old paths, the old paths are the platform and foundation of Adventism, which is the truths that are represented on the 1843 chart. The foundation and platform truths are on the 1850 chart, but the 1850 chart also has the pillars of Adventism. The old paths are these two charts. These two charts, Sister White, were produced based upon Habakkuk ch chapter 2. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 2 with me if you would for a moment. In chapter 2 says, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. If you have a marginal reference for that word reproved, you know what it means? When I'm argued with. Okay, the watchman in the Millerite history that was used by the Lord to produce both these charts. Sister White both says both these charts come from Habakkuk 2. The watchmen of the Millerite history were going to be argued with. They had a message that was going to be opposed. In that history, they had a message of truth to carry to their generation, and there was going to be a controversy over that message of truth. And then, So he's going to stand on his watchtower. The Millerite watchmen are going to stand on their watchtower, and they're going to watch and see what the Lord tells them to answer in this controversy. And verse 2 says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Their answer in the controversy were the truths represented on these charts. That was their answer. This was the argument. This was the controversy. These truths were the controversies that tested the generation of the Millerites. And the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. These are the foundational truths. And at the end of the world, when God's people return to the foundations, the watchmen at the end of the world are going to listen to what the Lord says. You're to answer in the argument. And your answer in the argument is the same as the Millerites. It's the truths represented on these charts. And these charts were given to the Millerites when the Lord entered into covenant with modern Israel in the 1844 time period. And the most important type of modern Israel was ancient Israel. And when the Lord entered into, ancient Israel, into covenant with ancient Israel at Mount Sinai, he gave them two tables. The law of God. And when he entered into covenant with modern Israel in 1844, he gave them two tables. Those foundational truths. And when the Lord was about to divorce ancient Israel in the time period of Christ, the Pharisees who thought they were defending the foundations of Israel, who thought they were defending the law of God, they didn't know who the law of God was when he was standing right in front of them. So when we get to the end of the world, the modern Pharisees in modern Israel are going to be those that profess to be the defenders of Orthodox Adventism and they're not going to know what the two tables that the Lord gave to modern Israel are all about. So this is serious business. We're here. The controversy over the foundations is here. But I digress. <coughs> You can see a quote here um, from Testimonies, Volume 8, page 296, where Sister White, these two paragraphs, I'm going to take the last two sentences of the first paragraph. She says, They make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin and rob the people of God of their past experience, giving them a false science. She's talking about the beginning history of Adventism, and then she quotes Jeremiah 6.16 about walking in the old past. I'm in the center of page 1 of our notes. And I'm just getting ready to go into the second paragraph of Testimonies 8. And it says, Let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith, the foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work. Sister White here is telling us that these truths are the old paths. They're the foundations. They're the platform. Now in... When we had these printed, the... The Microsoft Word attributes were lost and this got pushed down, unfortunately, but sealed with seven seals. This is Revelation chapter 5.
time is fleeting away. <laughs> and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And then in chapter 6, when he begins to open the seven seals, you'll notice that when he opens the first seal, in verse 1, once it's opened, what does he say? Come and see. And when he opens the second seal, come and see. Third seal, come and see. Fourth seal, come and see. Come and see. Now here's my point. We're going to show you that Sister White says the book that's sealed with seven seal is the Bible. And the pioneer, the correct pioneer, pioneer understanding is that when the book of Daniel was unsealed at the time of the end in 1798, the line of the tribe of Judah began to remove the seals from the Bible one at a time, identifying a progressive development of truth. It's an increase of knowledge in the book of Daniel, and in Revelation it's one seal at a time, a progressive truth that would test this generation. Both these processes begin at the time of the end. But as John sees the Bible, sealed with seven seals, he knows there's something important in it, but he knows no one can open it. No human being can open the Bible. Only the line of the tribe of Judah can open the Bible. And when John, when John sees it and understands no one can open, what's he do? He starts crying. Okay. And then when each seal is removed, the pronouncement is, come and see. So, next quote will tell us, that the book that is sealed with seven seals is the Bible, and it tells us also how the Bible becomes sealed up. It's Baldwin McGann, page 58. When Christ came to this earth, the traditions that had been handed down from generation to generation, the human interpretation of the scriptures hid from men the truth as it is in Jesus. The truth was buried beneath a mass of tradition. The spiritual import of the sacred volumes. What's the sacred volumes? It's the Bible. The spiritual import of the sacred volumes was lost, for in their unbelief men locked the door of the heavenly treasure. Darkness covered the earth, and gross darkness the people. Truth looked down from heaven to earth, but nowhere was revealed the divine impress. A gloom like a pall of death overspread the earth. But the lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed. He opened the book that closed the book of divine instruction. What's the book that's sealed with seven seals? It's the sacred volumes. It's the book of divine instruction. It's the Bible. And it becomes sealed up how? By the reception of traditions and cu of customs. Traditions and customs that have been handed down from generation to generation. What seals up the word of God is traditions and customs that come down to us through history. Alright. The next quote. The scribes and Pharisees profess to explain the scriptures, but they explain them in accordance with their own ideas and traditions. The customs and maxims became more and more exacting. In a spiritual sense, the sacred word became to them as a sealed book, closed to their comprehension. Notice the next quote. Christ is the originator of all truth. By the work of the enemy, the precious gems of truth have been torn from their setting and placed in a framework of error. Christ came to re replace the what? Can everyone say the jewels of truth? Can, let's say it at the same time. The jewels of truth. All right. He came to set the jewels of truth in their rightful position. He rescued them from, now say this with me, the rubbish of error. And he's done this in every generation. In every generation, there's a time of the end where there's a, a truth unsealed that's going to test that generation. And the one that unseals that truth is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. All right? He rescued them from the rubbish of error, gave them a new power, and bade them to stand forever. He could use these truths with perfect freedom, for he was their author. He had cast them into the mind of some generations. Each generation. Notice the next quote, Review in Herald, June 4th, 1889. In the time of the saviors, the Jews had so covered over the precious jewels of church, truth with the rubbish of traditions and fable that it was impossible to distinguish true from the false. 
The next quote has to do with Phariseeism covering the jewels of truth. After that, the same thing happened in the time of the Reformation. I'm on page four. I'm not going to read these. In the time of the Millerites, the rubbish of error was removed in order to reveal the jewels of truth. And today, we're told the same thing will happen in these two quotes. There is a, there is a chapter in the book Early Writings that is inspired that Ellen White did not write. Did you know that? I mean, they like to accuse her, accuse her of plagiarism, but she didn't even put one word into this. And she didn't write it, and it's inspired. And we're going to read through that now. Page 5, William Miller's Dream. Now who's William Miller? William Miller is the man the Lord used to do what? To assemble the foundational jewels of Adventism. Right? So this is his dream. I'm on the top of page 5. Everyone there? I dreamed that God by an unseen hand sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square made of ebony and pearls curiously inlaid. To the casket there was a key attached. Now keep your finger there but turn over to the next page under casket keys and rubbish and you'll see a comment by James White. James White says about this part of the dream he says the casket represents the great truths of the Bible relative to the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ which brother, were given Brother Miller to publish to the world. The key attached was his manner of interpreting the prophetic word. Comparing scripture with scripture, the Bible its own interpreter. With this key, Brother Miller opened the casket or the great truths of the advent to the world. The dirt and shaving sand and all manner of rubbish represent the various and numerous what? Errors that have been brought into in among Second Advent believers since the autumn of 1844. So go back to William Miller's dream. I dreamed that God by an unseen hand sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square. Why do we have to know that? Why do we have to know the size of this casket? What is 10 by 6 by 6? It's 360. And the most important rule adopted by William Miller was the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. A day equals a year. And how many days are in a biblical year? 360. The truth of God's word is represented in the casket. But what was the primary truth that William Miller saw was the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. And it's right there in the statement 10 by 6 by 6. Are there any accidents in the Word of God? I immediately took the key, the rules of interpretation that were, he adopted, and opened the Bible, the casket, when to my wonder and surprise I found it filled with all sorts and sizes of truths, jewels, diamonds, precious stones, and gold and silver coin of every dimension and value beautifully arranged in their several places in the casket, and thus arranged they reflected a light and glory equaled only to the sun. That's these truths, brothers and sisters. This is what he saw. I thought it was not my duty to enjoy this wonderful sight alone, although my heart was overjoyed at the brilliancy, beauty, and value of its contents. I therefore placed it on the center table in my room and gave out word that all who had desire might come and see the most glorious and brilliant sight ever seen by man in this life. The people began to come in, at first in few in number, but increasing to a crowd. When they first looked into the casket, they would wonder and shout for joy. But when the spectators increased, everyone would begin to trouble the jewels, taking them out of the casket and scattering them upon the table. Now, brothers and sisters, what the Bible prophets call the 2520 time prophecy is the scattering. All right? The 2520 year time prophecy that ended in 1798 was the scattering of the northern kingdom. They were scattered for seven times for 2520 years. The 2520 that ended in 1844 was the scattering of the southern kingdom. They had been scattered for seven times, 2520 years. 
So let's count how many times these truths are scattered as we go down through. Taking them out of the casket and scattering them on the table, one scattering. I begin to think that the owner would require the caskets and jewels again at my hand, and if I suffer them to be too scattered, I would never place them in the places in the casket again as before, and I f and felt I should never be able to meet the accountability, for it would be immense. I then began to plead with the people not to handle them, nor to take them out of the casket, but the more I pleaded, the more they three scattered. And now they seem to four scatter them all over the room and the floor and on the piece of and every piece of furniture in the room. I then saw that among the genuine jewels and coins they had five scattered an innumerable quantity of spurious jewels and counterfeit coin. I was highly incensed at their base conduct and and in gratitude and reproved and reproached them for it, but the more I reproved, the more they six scattered the spurious jewels and false coins among the genuine. These foundational truths, they're getting covered up with the rubbish of error. I then became vexed in my physical soul and began to use physical force to push them out of the room. But while I was pushing one out, three more would enter and bring in dirt shavings, dirt and shavings and sand and all manage of rubbish until they covered every one of the true jewels, diamonds and coins, and they were excluded from my sight. They also tore in pieces my casket and seven scattered it among the ra rubbish. What's his casket? The Bible, brothers and sisters, if you study the controversy in the 1930s, there was a group of faithful men in Adventism that were attempting to defend the pioneer position on the daily in the book of Daniel. One of those men was a guy named B.J. Wilkerson. B.J. Wilkerson, do you, any of you know him? The premise of, of his, he was a faithful Adventist, the premise of his argument was the Bible. He argued that the men, that Daniels and Prescott, that were promoting the false view of the daily, the way they were bringing it in, is by, in the, by bringing in the new translations of the Bible. He says if you use the new translations, you can, you can push that argument, but if you stick to the King James, no way. You see, William Miller saw the casket getting torn up as time progressed. And he's seen the foundational truths of Adventism getting covered up with rubbish. And it got scattered among the rubbish seven times. Seven times. I thought no man regarded my sorrow or anger. And I became wholly discouraged and disheartened. And he did what? He sat down and wept. Now brothers and sisters, in 1798, in Revelation chapter 5, John sees the word of God sealed up. And no man can open the word of God. So what does John do? He weeps and immediately the line of the tribe of Judah comes in and begins to open the word of God. William Miller is the man that was used to assemble these truths into the foundations of Adventism. And he has a dream where he sees these truths getting buried with rubbish. He just happens to say, that they're scattered seven times. He gets so disheartened that he begins to weep and then notice what happens. While I was thus weeping and mourning for my great loss and accountability, I remembered God and earnestly prayed that he would send me help. Immediately the door opened and a man entered the room when the people all left it and he, having a dirt brush in his hand, opened the windows and began to brush the dirt and rubbish from the room. This takes place, brothers and sisters. The dirt brush man arrives right here at the time of the end for the 144,000. Because that's where the dirt brush man, the line of the tribe of Judah, arrived in the Millerite history, was at the time of the end. He unsealed the book of Daniel. Right here, the dirt brush man begins to unseal the seven thunders, which include a return to the foundations of Adventism. I cried, with, I cried to him to forbear, for there were some precious jewels scattered among the rubbish. He told me to fear not. Who says fear not? That's Christ. Christ is the dirt brush man. Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. For he would take care of them. Then while he brushed the dirt and rubbish, false jewels and counterfeit coin, all rose and went out the window like a cloud and the wind carried them away. In the bustle I closed my eyes for a moment. When I opened them, the rubbish was all gone. The precious jewels, the diamonds, the gold and the s silver coins lay scattered in profusion all over the room. He then placed on the table a casket. What's the casket? 
the word of God. But this casket, it says, is much larger and more beautiful. Why is this casket at the end much larger and more beautiful? The Bible and the spirit of prophecy at the end of the world, brothers and sisters. It's much larger and more beautiful than the former. And gathered up the jewels, the diamonds, the coins by the handful and cast them into the casket till not one was left. Although some of the diamonds were not bigger than a point of a pin. He then called upon me to what? Come and see. When Jesus was opening the seals in this history, he'd open his seal and then what would he do? Say, come and see. The dirt brush man is opening these truths. And he's not saying, he's not saying come and see. You know what he's doing? He's commanding Seventh-day Adventists to come and see. Because this truth is what tests Adventism. And if you refuse to come and see, you're about to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Come and see. I looked into the casket, but my eyes were dazzled with the sight. They shone ten times their former glory. And the first time he looked at them, they shone as bright as the sun. This is ten times brighter than the sun. I thought that they had scoured in the sand. I thought that they had been scoured in the sand by the feet of those wicked persons who had scattered and trod them in the dust. Thus were they were arranged in beautiful order in the casket, every one in his place without any visible pains of the man who cast them in. I shouted with jer- very joy, and that shout awoke me. Brothers and sisters, when the dirt brush man begins to unseal the truce to the 144,000, there comes a point in time where William Miller's awoke. What wakes up the virgins? Behold, there comes a cry at midnight, the midnight cry. That's where they wake up. William Miller is illustrating this in the terms of our day and age. This is wake up time for Adventism. It's the return to the foundations. On the bottom of the page six it says, the scriptures are given for our benefit that we may have instruction in righteousness. Precious rays of light have been obscured by clouds of error, but Christ is ready to sweep away the mist of error and superstition and to reveal to us the brightness of his Father's glory so that we may say as the disciples, did not our heart burn within us? To hold yourselves aloof from the investigation of truth is not the way to carry out our Savior's injunction to search the scriptures. It is digging for hidden treasures to... Is it digging for hidden treasures to call the results of someone's labor a mass of rubbish and make no critical examination to see whether or not there are precious jewels of truth in the collections of thoughts which you condemn? Will those who have almost everything to learn keep themselves away from every meeting where there's an opportunity to investigate the messages that come to the people simply because they imagine the views held by the teachers of truth may be out of harmony with what they have conceived as truth? Thus it was with the Jews in the days of Christ and we are warned not to do as they did and be led to choose darkness rather than light because there was in them an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Not one of those who imagine they know it all is too old or too intelligent to learn from the humblest of the messengers of the living God. We're repeating the history of Christ. There's a message that's being opened up to God's people and the Pharisees are rising up to fight the message. And the greatest majority of, the, of God's people are standing in the middle ground, unsure of what they should do. Now, brothers and sisters, after 1844, time is no longer. And if you will receive it, if you can receive it, at the time of the end for the 144,000, the dirt brush man, the line of the tribe of Judah, opened the seven thunders to this generation. He began to sweep the rubbish out of the windows in order to reestablish the foundational truths of Adventism because that's what we have to do. We have to walk in the old paths. But there will be a group that say, we will not walk therein. So whatever point of history you want to put here, the time of the end for the 144,000 that parallels 1798 is the time when William Miller weeps. And when William Miller weeps, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the dirt brush man, comes and unseals the seven thunders, whatever they represent. But, that doesn't take place in William Miller's dream until there are, there is a scattering that is identified as seven times. The scattering 
is a term for the 2520 and William Miller marked the scattering in his dream seven times and seven times is 2520 and therefore at the beginning history of the 144,000 there will be a 2520 that concludes it's the 2520 that's symbolically represented in the seven times of William Miller dreams dream that marks the beginning when the dirt brush man begins to take God's people back to the foundations of Adventism if you will receive it but this history progresses there's a warning message that comes in this history it's the first angel's message there's a difference between the Millerite history and our history we've dealt with this this week brothers and sisters in each of these histories there's two doors that closes two doors that close it's represented by the two times Christ cleansed the temple and how did Christ cleanse the temple sister white says divinity flashed through humanity and that drove the people out of the temple and sister white says so too in the last work for for the world two calls are made to the churches in the Millerite history there was a manifestation of power on August 11th 1840 when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 descended that manifestation of power flashed through humanity and by 1842 the Protestants closed their doors against that message then in the midnight cry in the summer of 1844 there was divinity flashed through humanity and there was a door that closed on October 22nd 1844 the temple had been cleansed twice and in our day and age the temple gets cleansed twice there's a manifestation of the power of God that produces a fleeing and the door closes the difference in our day and age is that the door that closed here in the Millerite history it closed on the Protestant world outside of the Millerites first and then it closed on the Millerites second but we know at the end of the world that judgment begins with the house of God and the first door that closes at the end of the world the first temple cleansing at the end of the world takes place in Adventism and when a warning message comes when a warning message comes there's a door that closes and then there's a divine pronouncement the summer of 1844 the divine pronouncement for that history was that Babylon was fallen in the story of Belshazzar the divine pronouncement was many many tell you the 2520 the warning message for Nimrod was presented by Noah and Shem the divine pronouncement was nothing would be restrained from their imagination so before our door closes before judgment comes to us the 144,000 there will be a divine pronouncement that we've rejected this testing message here at the end of the world and the divine pronouncement for for Nimrod what was his judgment confusion of languages and scattering scattering well the scattering the 2520 that was also connected with the judgment for the Millerites and the 2520 is the scattering that was also connected to the judgment of Belshazzar and the 2520 is the judgment was connected to the judgment of Nebuchadnezzar so brothers and sisters for Adventism based upon Nimrod the Millerites Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar upon those four lines when the divine pronouncement comes to Adventism at the end of the world it's the handwriting on the wall it's many many tekel you farson it's the divine pronouncement saying that you've rejected the message and the message for Adventism at the end of the world is the foundational truths we will not walk therein and a symbol of those foundational truths is the 2520 so the divine pronouncement for Adventism at the end of their history when the door closes is this very discussion that we're having right here it's this controversy right here brothers and sisters the handwritings on the wall and when the handwritings on the wall in that very night Belshazzar was slain the history of the 144,000 begins with William Miller's 2520 and it begins ends with the argument over these foundational truths as represented by the very first time prophecy that William Miller discovered the 2520 
And according to William Miller, it was after he discovered this that he discovered the 2300. And this foundational truth is the old pass that we were going to say, we will not walk therein. And Jeremiah says about those old paths, that's where we find rest for our souls. Now, brothers and sisters, some of you haven't been here. I'm going to finish this off very quickly. Some of you haven't been here this week where we identified that the three angels' messages were three tests. We talked a little bit about it this morning. And the first test for Adventism, the first test is always a reformer. William Miller was a reformer. He's compared to Elijah. He's compared, compared to John the Baptist, Moses, Noah. The reform message that tests Adventism at the end of the world, our first test is the reform message is represented by Sister White. And that's why on, on the bottom of your page, on the very last quote on page 7, it says, One thing is certain, those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. And the symbol of the reform movements... And there are several reform movements laid out in the spirit of prophecy, whether it's true education, country living, dress reform, health reform, all those reform movements. The symbol of all of them is the right arm of the third angel's message. It's the health message. Why do you say that? Because scripture says so. This is where mankind fell. This is the first of the three tests that Christ took up, was it not? So the first test for Adventism at the end of the world is represented in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1 is the first test. Now we went over this this week. The second test for Adventism is the image of the beast. It's the coming together of church and state in the United States just before the Sunday law. And if you see the church and state coming together in the United States, then what you're seeing in the terminology of Noah is that the animals are getting on the ark. And if you see church and state coming together in the United States and you don't understand from that that probation's about to close, you're going to be lost. The animals are on the ark. And that's the second test. And under the second test, under Daniel 2, the, there's a big quote. Go to the, the, the small quote. I'm on page 8 under Daniel 2. Second quote says, The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is a great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test they must have before they're sealed. And we went through this this week. Brothers and sisters, we're sealed at the Sunday law. Our probation closes at the Sunday law. And there's a test that comes to us before our probation closes, before we're sealed, that's called the image of the beast test. It has to do with church and state coming together. And in Daniel chapter 2, in the feet of Daniel chapter 2, in the image, the iron and the clay, Sister White tells us that it's the combination of church and state. You have the quote on your paper. And Daniel chapter 2 is identifying the second test for Adventism at the end of the world. And where the door closes for Adventism at the end of the world, brothers and sisters, is the Sunday law. That's Daniel chapter 3. You'll see two quotes where Sister White, and there's 11 different quotes where Sister White compares the test on the plain of Dura with the Sunday law. You have two there. See, Daniel chapter 1, that's the first test for Adventism. That's the first angel's message. Daniel chapter 2, it's the second test. That's the image of the beast test. And Daniel chapter 3, it's the Sunday law test. And Daniel chapter 4, what's Daniel chapter 4? That's the everlasting gospel. That's the three angels' message. That's Nebuchadnezzar. What's Daniel chapter 5? Daniel chapter 5 is the story of Belshazzar, which is illustrating that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. And Daniel chapter 6 represents the persecution that takes place on God's people in the Sunday law crisis when Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. And brothers and sisters, this isn't conjecture. This is a truth that has been opened up by the lion of the tribe of Judah as he brings the books of Daniel and Revelation together and clarifies the message for Adventism today. And the dirt brush man of William Miller's dream is now sweeping the rubbish out of the windows at the very time in Adventism, where there is a group, a vocal group in Adventism saying, we will not walk there in, in those old paths. Shall we pray? (laughs) 
Father in heaven, we wish that you would allow us to understand these things in the, in the way that you would best use them to awaken us to our personal need of preparation and our responsibility to those around us. We understand that we are living in a time period that is represented by Laodicea and that Laodicea is standing on the verge of being spewed out of your mouth. We ask that you do what it takes to to change us into your image, that we can be used by your Holy Spirit to reach out to those around us to, f to finish this work, first in our life and then your work in the world. We ask for your continued blessing upon these meetings this Sabbath day. We ask that you continue to pour your Holy Spirit out upon us in latter rain power. For you've told us in Zechariah 10.1 that we're to pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. This we are doing. So bless us. Continue to be with us throughout the rest of this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.